that's I think the bonus track on the CD are gallons of rubber alcohol and so far it sounds very spontaneous if you record that on the spot. <laughs> Which yeah. song is it? We is made that song thing? up on the spot. I just started playing that guitar part and then Chris and Dave just started playing and then we were, we were as we were recording and I just made up the that's lyrics. That's that we one that song we recorded this song in uh, Rio de Janeiro. Oh yeah. yeah. At the, like this tiny BMG B studio that hasn't been used for like six years, and they had this like Neve board. And they blew the dust off it, and we just plugged in and just started screwing around, mm. and we did that song. It was, it was total spontaneous, you know. It was just one of those things. Yeah, it gives that feeling. It's free association. What the hell does the title mean anyway? In utero, I think there's like an in vitro uh, pregnancy, and there's or no. I mean, not that song. Oh, gallons of rubbing alcohol. We'll cleanse this strip. Well, I guess it's our contempt for the hairspray, um, Guns N' Roses poison scene that was going on in LA a few hmm. years ago. Something else I found it. Um, I know one question beforehand. Uh, the, re the way you recorded was just on an eight track machine. Is that news? No, no, that's no, not that's a 24 track. It's the same track. board that recorded um, Back in Black by ECDC. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what was the story that some of the songs have been remixed? Two songs were remixed. Um, Which were? Heart Shaped Box and All Apologies. Because the vocals weren't loud enough and I wanted to um, put some harmony vocals in the background that I failed to do when we recorded with Steve. So we asked Scott Litt to come down and do it. Mm -hmm. It took about a day or two. Yeah, a days. What I noticed as well, not only on this record, but on the records before too, there are some very fine harmonies and melodies in it, which makes me wonder, does one of you had uh, sort of a musical education? I don't think Absolutely any of us Absolutely not. Nothing I, at all. I have no concept of, of, of knowing how to be a musician at all whatsoever. I mean, I don't know the names of chords to play. I don't know how to do major and minor chords on a guitar at all. I mean, I couldn't even pass, you know, guitar 101, folk guitar 101, you know. I mean, hmm. there, everyone knows more than I do. Hmm. I took accordion lessons when I was a little kid. I played the trombone, I think, when I was about eight. For real? I was in band and I played snare drum during junior high and grade school and um, I never learned how to read music. I just mm -hmm. copied the other people that, that took the time to learn how to read and it was just so simple. You know, boom, tap, boom, tap, boom, tap, 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 and I just copied them, you know, just to pass. I didn't see any reason to, even at that age I didn't see any reason to learn anything that someone else has written, you know, if you go by a text, then you, you're pretty limited, you know. Do you consider... It's our okay. burning. Could, okay. do, do you consider yourself being more a songwriter or a guitar player? Oh, songwriter. I have no desire to, um, to um, become any better of a guitar player. I just don't. I'm, I'm not into musicianship at all. I don't, I don't have any respect for it. I just hate it. You know, to learn how to read music or to understand arpeggios and Dorian modes and all that stuff is just a waste of time. It's just, it just, you know, it gets in the way of originality. Do you like Leonard Cohen? Mm-hmm. And are there other writers who you could name as sort of an influence or people who impressed you in what they were doing? Mm, well, yeah, just mostly, you know, early to late 80s punk rock, American punk rock, and then, you know, late 70s English punk rock. Mm. Yeah, that had a lot to do with stuff that I was into. I was just pretty much consumed with that with that whole scene for so long that I, you know, I never really denied any of the other influences that I had before, which is like the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and stuff like that, dinosaur rock, but. What about writers, like lyricists or poetrists? Well, 
Probably Beckett's my favorite. I like him a lot. Plus, I mean, sometimes uh, when I read or listen to the lyrics, it sounds to me as if you're sort of inspired by the beat beat writers too. Yeah. Especially yeah, Burroughs is Burroughs. the king. Yeah. Yeah. I actually got to do a record with him, a 10 inch record. You are doing William. it. William. We, it's already out. Yeah. He did a, he did a um, passage from a, from a poem called The Priest They Called Him. And I played guitar in the background, just made a bunch of noise. What is, what is this guy like? Just, um, I don't know. I never met him. <laughs> I, I could have talked to him the other day. I was supposed to, uh, there was a, um, it was a setup meeting for me to call, for him to call me be, because um, we wanted him to be in our next video mm -hmm. because of the, mostly not because of our association with him or to exploit anything like that because, you know, maybe because I don't want anyone to think that I want to have a relationship with William Burroughs because of like, you know, my past drug use or my, my um, respect of him or anything. We ma mainly wanted him to be in our video because he's an odd looking character, you know. We wanted an, an older gentleman to be in our video and to do a few things, but we realized that the things that we wanted this older person to do was a bit degrading to have William Burroughs himself do it, you know. We wanted a person to be on a cross and in a hospital bed and stuff like that, and it was just too insulting to ask him, so I canceled the call. I mean, that was my chance of actually meeting him, and we've exchanged a letter hmm. through fax, and, um, you know, we have respect for what each other does, but I've never really had the opportunity. I mean, other than that, I haven't bothered to, you know, meet him yet, but I still want to. Yeah, he must I, be a great guy. Yeah. I would love to meet him one day. Yeah, his letter was really nice. On one or two songs, you hear a cello or uh, some string arrangement. Was that played live? Um, no, it was. We had her come in after we the basic tracks were down and mm. had her play along that, with it. Is that the cello player you uh, had in New York too? No, this cello player was um, Steve Albini's girlfriend at the time. And it was just a really, it was just a matter of convenience. She happened to play cello and we needed one, so she was there. And she turned out great, she did a really good job. Another question to Kurt again. Are you left-handed? Do you find it hard to get the right guitar for you? Usually, yeah. It's a bit easier now because I have an endorsement with Fender Guitars now, so they're making me left-handed Mustangs, and so it's a lot easier. It used to be a total pain in the ass. I mean, when we were on our first couple of tours, you know, I'd only have one guitar, and it was, it would have to be cheap, you know, a $30 guitar from a pawn shop, and I'd end up breaking it after the show, and then the next day was, was consumed with trying to find a pawn shop and, and the few dollars that we had to buy a guitar and then we'd have to turn turn the strings around and try to intonate it ourselves and it just made for a really out of tune raunchy experience you know during those first few years it was a pain in the ass trying to find a guitar yeah it was like the biggest dilemma of the day this one will work left-handed yeah it's kind of cut this part's notched a little bit you know uh -huh. It was a big hassle on those days. All the electronics are on the top. In fact, we even built a bunch of Mustangs one time. We bought some necks and made and, and took pieces of wood and cut out the bodies and, and put the necks on, and they were completely out of tune all the time. And well, we did a pretty good job at we it. We had this little assembly line in the garage, and we hung them up and painted them yeah. and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, honestly, you used some quite unique-looking guitars on stage anyway. Were those the ones you built yourself? Mm, I don't think so. Those were all destroyed in one tour. And that was about like four years ago, probably, hmm. at least. <laughs> but the ones I use now are just, um, I use this same Jaguar a lot, and um, um, mostly Mustangs. And I'm having Fender build me a, um, a special guitar that's like a mixture of a Mustang and a Jaguar, which might be kind of interesting. interesting. Did you give them the directions what you wanted? Yeah. Yeah, I took pic a picture of a Jaguar with a, 
with a Polaroid and a picture of a Mustang and then cut them down the middle and glued them together and said, build this. <laughs> uh, this record, Nutra, is getting more back to it towards bleach. And you, you said, like, months ago, that you want to get rid of some of the fans who just came from the pop side. Do you think you will achieve that? Or is the name Nirvana already gone so big that the fans will buy everything? Doesn't matter what it is. I don't know. Um, I don't think so, because we, when we put out Incesticide, it didn't sell very well at all. Mm -hmm. It didn't even sell like a few hundred thousand copies, you know? Uh, don't want to. Don't want to exclude anybody or anything, you know. No, we're not as concerned with that as as we used to be. Yeah. You know, it's not. I think that was like being a little reactionary. Yeah. Kind of going through the whole fame and fortune thing and just making statements like that. It's, you know. There's nothing you can do about it. You know, you can put on a cabaret show, and you know, and just make a total mockery out of your success, or just deal with it. Hmm. You know? I guess. Especially in the beginning, it must have been pretty hard to deal with that. Yeah, it was, because we were really concerned with losing the audience that was into us before, you know? Yeah. We still wanted those people because, you know, supposedly we feel like we relate to them in a way, you know? I mean, those are the kind of people that we share common interests with, and those are the people that we're friends with, you know? So, we were really worried about that. But I don't think we've lost very many of them, so it doesn't matter anymore. As long as they're there, we can, you know, just just forget about the, the idiots in the back, you know, as long as they aren't causing trouble. That's that, that was another concern that we had, is that if we were to have this massively mainstream audience that we were going to um, come across a lot of problems in, in live shows, you know, with with macho guys beating up on girls and, you know, starting fights and things like that. You know, the typical things that you see at a Van Halen show or something, you know. And we just didn't want to have to have to deal with something like that. I guess you must have found it pretty hard too, like getting that intensity that the band has when when you Uh, do you sometimes have the feeling that you lose intensity when you play like this big uh, arenas or bigger places? Yeah. yeah, I don't find myself having as much fun as I did when we played in clubs or mm. theaters. Um, the biggest example is that was when we played in Europe when we played all those outdoor festivals. I had a terrible time. I hated it. Like Chris and Dave were like 30 feet away from me. You know, it was like. Hi, you know, it just didn't seem right. So we're gonna make a few changes in our in our stage setup to alleviate some of those problems. You know, sure. um, we're gonna squeeze closer together. You know, on on these big stages, and whether that fucks with the visuals for the people out in the audience, oh well. You know, at least we'll play better. You know, enjoy ourselves. We played in front of like a hundred thousand people down in uh, Sao Paulo, Brazil, and just saw the video from the back of the stadium and then just like we were little ants on stage. Just yeah. like, God, I go, who's standing there? You know, I wonder how they feel about that. I don't think our music translates in that kind of situation either. Because mm -hmm. people can't appreciate the energy that is on stage at least, you know, because mm -hmm. they're so far away. It's yeah. almost understandable why a lot of um, lead singers in arena rock bands um, have this rapport with audience where they're going hey how's everybody doing how are you in the back people you know and stuff like that are you feeling all right because that's pretty much all you can understand when someone's saying something like that over a pa in front of a hundred thousand yeah. people you know it's just it's hard for us to adapt to that because we just can't do that we can't bring ourselves to be that ridiculous and, you know? and doing the ones, live shows like you know we try to experience this thing with the audience kind of reciprocate this uh feeling this energy and I don't know how that translates from three people to a hundred thousand people, you know? <laughs> it's like mathematically you know, <laughs> pretty wild. We need to get some, we need to get a horn section. Horn some section. Yeah, yeah. 
I didn't think you've been playing a second guitar player again. Yeah. Will it be Big John? No, it, we've um, we've hired um, Pat Smear, who's in the Germs. It's working out great. And He's got good energy. Hmm. So I think that he adds that he'll add that to the band live. And if one of us one of us is kind of slacking that night, I think we can count on him to keep the <laughs> yeah. energy going. You know. It's the backup engine. But uh, I guess it must, be, uh, must make your job a lot easier too. Yeah, it does. It totally relieves me of a lot of unnecessary things that I have to think about, you know. Hmm. Looking back, do you some, sometimes uh, sort of regret that major success of Nirv uh, Nevermind? I don't. Mm. No, because for the most part, I'm pretty convinced that most people like that record, you know. So, the more the merrier. I mean, if, if more, the more people that can listen to your music and enjoy it, the better it is, you know. If it was some big marketing scheme, then I think I'd probably feel guilty. But yeah, if it was a, a yeah, I if it was totally like agree. a contrived thing. I think, but it just happened organically, more organically than anything has in a long time, you know. So. It's flattering. Yeah. yeah, I mean, especially in the beginning, you sometimes had the feeling that even the record company was completely uh, overwhelmed by it. They didn't expect it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they were. They, they, they shipped, shipped like 40,000 copies and they sold out in like a day or two. Then you couldn't get the record for like a week until they. Get the deck, huh? Yeah. And, uh, it's nice to know that you can sell your music on the music alone, you know? I mean, at the time that it took off, and um, a lot of radio stations were playing it before we had a video, which is, you know, an uncommon thing in this day and age, you know? So it's not our pretty faces that are selling the records, it's the music. And it's so neat. Like it's our skilled musicianship. That's right. I walk into the Fred Meyer department store down in Longview, Washington, this tiny town. And I, and I look and I go, well, there's Mud Honey, there's Sebado, there's Sonic Youth. And I go, this is really great. You know yeah. I mean? And before, just you know, a couple years ago, that was impossible. Yeah. Totally uncalled for. And the kids down there are exposed to that. And I think it's really positive. But it obviously helped a lot of other bands, too. Well, we've happened, yeah, what happened to us has kind of opened a lot of doors. I think we were in the right place at the right time for like a rock and roll. Because those old rock dinosaurs, all the poofy doo hairspray bands were just hanging on and doing the same thing, basically emulating Hanoi rocks like over and over again. And that just, it stagnated like the Soviet economy or something. You know what I mean? Yeah, it got yeah. just as boring as grunge will within this year, you know. We did a photo shoot. Um, with this, with someone for a cover of a magazine, and he was telling us a story of how Bon Jovi came in and said, uh, "Make me." He came in with flannel shirt on, and he wanted. He said, "Make me look like Nirvana." And uh, wow. he said, "Well, <laughs> that's pretty flattering." <laughs> if bon Jovi wants to look like us. You know something's wrong. Then that just proves he's a desperate, untalented piece of shit. <laughs> Do you have yourself an explanation uh, for your success? An explanation? It's all in the cards. It's a roll of the dice. It's a lot of luck. A lot of luck. I think it was Being like in timing. the right place at the right time. I, th I think this whole, the old dinosaurs could, they just were holding on as long as possible. And we had this really strong song. And like there were like no number one rock records. Maybe R.E.M. was number one. And uh, Metallica came out and stuff. But, um, just change has to happen, you know, just part of the whole human experience has changed, so. I think that next we're probably going to be old hacks soon. There's going to be this young, happening band going on and we'll probably be slagging us off. It's like dinosaurs will be defensive and <laughs> we'll be so established. Make me you know? look like this new band. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we would have just totally consolidated our relationships with people at MTV, the music labels, and different magazines. We've so apologized to everybody. We're going to be uh, an establishment, and hopefully someone will come by and begging to kill us. Cover of Rolling Stone. <laughs> Please, I'm sorry. No, because we're, we're so in, we're so established. Cover of Rolling Stone, when do you guys want it? 
<laughs> Here's another line for you. We're like just totally, totally terrible. We're doing, we're hanging out with Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah. And Bruce Willis at Bruce their new Willis. club. Yeah, open new club. Uh, hey, I'm a Republican now, Chris. Hey, me hey, too. too. What do you that say? Dark, well, it was cool until we had to pay 38% or 36% taxes. Gee, you know, we got the shaft when we lived under Reagan, and now we're getting the shaft under Clinton. I say we vote for Pat Buchanan. <laughs> Rush those, Limbaugh. Rush Limbaugh. Rush Limbaugh. Those feminazis. <laughs> I guess that must be a strange situation Rush. anyway, suddenly being involved in like real big business things on the yeah. financial side, dealing with tax and whatsoever. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm happy to fucking suffer for, you know, I, I'll, I'll be glad to, um, you know, throw out more of the money that I made if it's going to be put in the right places, yeah. if it's going to help the economy. True. I mean, everybody should suffer, you know, everyone should start wearing sweaters and turning their heaters down and, you know. I don't mind, I didn't mind standing in gas lines when I was a little kid during Carter. I mean, I had to sit in the, in the car and wait in line with my dad and he just cursed Carter all the time, you know, what a bastard. The, in, you know, the convenience of America yeah. is ruined. Do they still everybody get Carter has to, bad time? Yeah, everybody has to swallow a little bit of bad medicine to make things better, so you know, fuck it. And they're kicking Clinton around, but it's like, remember Nixon? And Iran, Contra, Reagan, SNL s scandals. Nobody even brings that up. You know, it's just really crazy. Do you have a? Do you think as a band you have the chance to to move something in people's mind, to make them think, or at least get a message across? Well, it's not like a, a real conscious goal of ours yeah. or something that we prepared to do. It's just like it's, it just emulates the personalities that we have. You know, we, we've, we've always been conscious of political things as much as our, you know, mental capacity can hold, and we... <laughs> We've just been aware of things, and it just kind of surfaces, it comes out, just because that's what happens. I mean, we don't have, like, this angle that we're, like, a political band or yeah. anything. We've always you know? tried really hard to not put out too much of an image of being too politically conscious, you know, so so it gets in the way of the music because that you know that's more important and i think too like in this country that people are so apathetic and they're so un unconscious in front of their tv sets and somebody like us who has somewhat awareness it makes it look like we're really aware <laughs> we're, we're not i mean you know what i mean this is just things yeah. we're concerned about and we just talk about them you know just because we talk about them at home or we talk you know talk about it with friends we just happen to talk about things in interviews you know? Have you ever met the experience that groups like political or other social groups tried to to use you or uh, the success you have with the name? No, I don't. Reasons? I wouldn't say they've used us. There, we've we've had a few offers from from some political organizations like the Fair organization, who who um, has been has been um, working for years. To um, to expose a lot of um, injustices and and to try to um, promote real truths in, in a lot of um, a lot of things that have happened politically, you know, there, it's like an underground leftist organization that tries to expose the truths, and you know, and they're totally masked over by USA Today and, and magazines like that, you know, right wing owned magazines that. A lot of time, the, the truth and, and the details of a story aren't ever reported, yeah. and that's what this organization does. So, they came to us, and of course, we're going to, you know, want to do something with them to, to help them out because I wouldn't say anyone's tried to take advantage of us in that way at all. Fair, fair is an acronym for fairness and, and accuracy in reporting. Mm -hmm. and I think I've been really conscious of what's been going on in the media with, you know, being part of the media, you know, and then I just look at the way the press responds, it's like, you know, being all over the president or being all over Waco, Texas, or Amy Fisher, you know, it's really interesting. There's a lot of bozos out there who just, they, they form public opinion, you know, people really don't think for themselves and they have a big responsibility, so they're just basically exploiting it. And uh, there's, a, there's this group here that just moves into, like, truth, reality. Just like these bad demo demagogues, demagoguery politicians, manipulate.
manipulate people and, and spreading their lies for their own personal gain, you know. Some former ex communists or ex communists or like mm -hmm. former ex communists. I can't get Thank into you. it too. My brain is weak. Help oh, people yeah. out, you know. That's just putting band aids on the situation. <laughs> until they dispose of the regimes over there. Great. Right. There's not going to be any change, you know. Mm -hmm. They don't even recognize the Serbian opposition. The guys languishing in prison, they beat the hell out of him. They don't even help the guy out, you know. There were elections in Serbia, like at Milan yeah. Panic, it was a sham yeah. election, and nobody did anything about it, you know. Okay, I'm back. Okay. Where were we? Rock and roll. After all the uh, oh, no, experience you've made with the uh, media all over the world, do you still believe what you read? or see on television? Never, mm. never. I never did before, mm. but I don't believe even more now. I know that I don't even have the right, it's the only thing I've learned, I don't have the right to, to make an opinion on anything that I read or see on television until I go to the fucking source myself, personally. I, I d my attitude has changed so much within the last couple of years, mainly just because of the crap that's been written about us that I don't even, um, I, I don't even find myself like having very many opinions on bands anymore or putting them down or or you know going out of my way to like to have any kind of expression about them at all because I don't know these people you know Bon Jovi could be one of the nicest people in the world his mm -hmm. music sucks but you know I, I don't even want to bother with with even expressing those kind of opinions anymore because I know that there are people, you know, probably in this town right now talking about us, you know. So I heard that Chris Novoselic, uh, you know, blah, blah, blah. It's with just, his dog. With his grandmother's dog. And it has AIDS. Dude. Which is not true, by the way. I was just wondering, does that sometimes affect your private life too? I mean, your friends or your family are reading the stories about you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's weird to, to talk with your wife's great-grandparents and they bring up something like that. You're just like, man, that's not true at all. And you have to explain to them how people have different agendas. Each writer has their own perspective and maybe the magazine edit editor has an agenda, you know what I mean? And, mm -hmm. and you're just, you're at their mercy, basically. So you can do be as honest as possible and put on a happy face. Roll with the punches. <clears throat> I mean, frankly, what surprised me, even though I'm working in the media, there were certain magazines where I thought, okay, whatever they print is at least well researched, like Newsweek in America or Spiegel in Germany. I found it quite confusing that um, even though made up, they made up stories. Oh yeah, They're I was surprised about Newsweek. I thought they were. I'm just not surprised at all. Caliber, you know. No magazine has any ethics at all. There, there isn't any magazine mainstream that would, magazine. yeah, a mainstream magazine that would ever, um, ever, you know, stop a good story. You know, they yeah. want to sell magazines. They're, they're in the entertainment business. Yeah, that's. And that's they the use, point. you know, but they use politics as some kind of fucking fake tool to sell their magazines. Right, right. But in this case, I thought this is a sort of magazine who have to lose us. A real reputation as well. I think we're going to have to get David. Uh, David no one, Bergen. There is no one that is challenging these magazines, though. You know, there are no protection laws against, um, you know, f false things that are written about about celebrities. You know, their libel suits are a complete farce. You know, it, you, mm -hmm. you basically a libel suit is just a. Um, a challenge between two people that have a lot of money, you know, and whoever has the most money will win it, you know. And if you go up against Condé Nast or some major corporation that owns a whole bunch of magazines and owns this one magazine that wrote shit about you, they'll just filibuster for years and, and you'll spend hundreds of thousands of dollars in challenging them and you'll end up losing. So there's really, you can't even get to that first stage of even filing for a libel law. I mean, libel suits. just... It's a waste of time. It's pretty wild, like all the relationships between people and bands and labels and between magazines and, and all that stuff, you know. You have someone like Bill Clinton had a bad time, so he hired David Gergen, who started
started throwing parties for the press corps, started smoothing people over because he had relationships. And what do you know? Good news coming out of Washington for Clinton. You know, yeah, it's, it's, it's this manufactured perception. It's just like it's, it's it's not real. It's all just a charade. You know, and the bottom line is Stoli vodka ads on the back, full page Stoli vodka ads on the back page, or Marlboro Man ads. You know, they just get that money and. Everything in between isn't really that important. Television, same way. So we're going to start our own magazine. It's going to be called uh, The Nerve Racker. Nerve Racker. Yeah. That's a good name, anyway. <laughs> we're going to character assassinations left and right. We're going to schmooze it up with people. Whoever greases our palm the most is going to get a full cover story. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Step one, take the guys out for dinner. I'll have <laughs> lobster, thank you. Step two, get me in, on, in the show for free. Yeah, get me in the show for three, free. Step three, oh, uh, well, I got this niece. She needs a new, I want to get her a Mustang car. For, done. You're on the cover of Nerve Racker. Well, Unscrupulous see. magazine, go ahead. How serious do you take all these uh, cliches and standards of the business? and the roles people play. Oh, well, I, I just th think of like the wrestling industry, like WWF, World whatever, Federation Wrestling, and there's like uh, Hulk Hogan and all those Roddy, Rowdy Piper. And mm -hmm. Can you imagine all the politics going on in there, you know? Well, he's gonna win this match, but see, he has to lose this match, and well, they're gonna be on this TV show, and it's just like, wow, all the drama, all the egos, personalities, the world, Federation Wrestling. <laughs> it's like, get me out of here. Yeah. Getting back to the record, um, is, is it incidentally that the opening track of the, um, the intro of um, Rape Me sounds a bit like some part in Nevermind? What part in Nevermind? Smells like Come Teen Spirit. On. I read the question. I was just trying well, to remember that. <laughs> um, yes. What's so, it, what was the hit song off the uh, second NAC it's an record? Obvious inside joke. If you play the hit song off the second NAC record, it sounds like My Sharona. If you play it backwards, it sounds like My Sharona. Really? So that's what we were doing. Shit. But you should, I, I recommend playing In Utero backwards, and that's. Ooh, I let it slip. Oh, oh. I shouldn't have said that. There's all kinds of. Kurt is dead stuff, you know. Oh. Uh, total devil worship of the worst kind. Altars, virgin. Now some naked. white trash mothers are going to sue us after they beat their children for a few years and neglect them, and then they kill themselves and blame it on us. That's and they right. Blow their faces off. I and gave him like a good Christian upbringing. Dope, man. What happened? I tanned his ass every day. He should have turned out just fine. If it wasn't for that record. <laughs> tanned his ass. But there's no kids uh, committed suicide yet listening to a, listening a Nirvana song. Let's hope. <laughs> They're committing social suicide. And this is so typical American. You never get that in uh, Europe or in Germany. Really. Well, this is, I don't know what the, there's a lot of symptoms out there like kids killing themselves or people walking in McDonald's and blowing people away. They're always killing people that don't deserve it though. Yeah. You know, there's you can you know, if you're gonna go kill a bunch of people, why not assassinate someone who deserves it, you know? But they don't they don't show that as like a, a symptom. They just say that's a problem. Random act of violence, but maybe that's a symptom of the kind of country we live in. People's <laughs> values, you know what I mean? I say they're all just fucked. <laughs> I'll answer that question first off by saying that everybody's fucked, <laughs> if you ask me. And then where do we take it from there? We're all fucked. All right, well, we've established something, some kind of criteria, like a base to where to get onto. Maybe we're all a bunch And of, how are they fucked? And how are they fucked? Well, I don't want to think about that because that just involves the effort. You know what because I mean? Then if I just waste my time thinking about it and, and we create some kind of dialogue about it for a while, then we'll just come back to the conclusion that we're 
everybody's fucked. Everybody's fucked, you know. So we just have to take up smoking and live a leisurely lifestyle. You know, bombs in third world countries, walk into McDonald's and shopping malls with automatic weapons readily available. Hey, if life gets too tough, just buy an AK-47 and walk into McDonald's. You'll feel better. Yeah, because you hate Mondays. What's your favorite day of the week? Pardon? What's your favorite day of the week? Oh, I guess Wednesday. Wednesday? Yeah. Because you're in the middle of the week. When's Friday, man? PGIF. Thank God it's Friday. <laughs> That's a good move. <laughs> Uh, Sunday, because it's the Sabbath, the day of the Lord. But if you're a Seventh-day Adventist, your Sabbath is on a Saturday. And they don't eat meat, by the way. And they seem like nice people. I don't know how preachy they get. So if I was to like subscribe to some, any kind of Christian dogma, maybe be a Seventh-day Adventist. I'd, I'd be a Jehovah Witness. You'd be a hobo witness. Kurt's walking around witness. peddling watchtowers. Hobo witness. I'd be a moron. Mormon. 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 Bob, by the way, who's uh, that Francis Farmer who's going to have a revenge on uh, Seattle? What? What about it? What denomination yeah. was she? <laughs> uh, probably what Methodist about it? Oh, we should read Dreamland by this PI reporter who wrote this book about her. It's really good. She was, you know, you know her story, don't you? She's an actress that was, um, was a, um, she was kind of a foul mouthed person, What's a you know, and she, she and she hated the whole um, Hollywood scene, and she expressed her hatred for them publicly, and so, um, and she also, when she was like, I think she was 15, she entered this essay contest when she was living here in Seattle, entitled "God Is Dead," and uh, a lot of people accused her of being a communist. Hmm. And then she went to New York and and uh, was a part of this um, acting troupe. And so it supposedly had communist ties too. And uh, so then there's this big conspiracy amongst a judge, a very well known, prominent judge here in Seattle, and a bunch of other people who had ties with Hollywood. And they basically just set her up and ruined her life, you know? They, um, you know, had some pictures taken of her when she was arrested for drunk driving. And um, it just, it was a big, huge scandal. And she eventually was sent to a mental institution and given a lobotomy and raped every day for years and just totally abused and ended up like working at a at a um, Four Seasons restaurant alone and dying by herself. It was Still a Bainbridge down. Island. That's where she was uh, institutionalized, right over there. Mm -hmm. It was this whole broken down like hmm. infirmary there. For years, every night there were lines of um, custodians, friends, and, and people, you know, part of the staff who would wait in line to rape her every day, you know? She went through a lot of shit. And it just disgusts me, you know, to know that there are some of the people that are part of that conspiracy are living here in Seattle in their comfortable, cushy little homes with their families, and, you know, mm -hmm. it's 20, you know, it's 40 years after the fact, and it's... Just, Is uh, it just God, makes not a fair one? Yeah. Still That's what the Christians say. Citizens. God, why was there Auschwitz? Well, I'm a just God, not a fair one. Oh, okay. You know? Yeah. Why is there Lon Mavon? Well, I'm a... Ask St. Paul. He'll tell you all about it. He wrote this book called The Bible. I'm the little Jew that wrote the Bible. <laughs> Do you have already uh, set a tour? Not for Europe, just, just for the States. We're gonna take it one tour at a time. I mean, we definitely want to and plan to go over to Europe, you know, in Japan, Australia. But... It'll probably be early, probably January or something like that. We'll be in Europe. I mean, touring must have changed for you quite a lot, too. Suddenly being confronted with this giant machinery, a whole of, lot of people. I mean, when you play big venues, you need yeah. to have a lot of people and equipment and yeah. a real organization well, behind it. Yeah, we used to drive around, just three guys in a van. Yeah. And but, gear. you know, for compared to a lot of other bands that are on our scale, 
like we only have like a handful of roadies and people and a tour manager and a helper for him you know it's like a lot of bands that are bigger than us or as big as us you know have like 50 people on the road with them it's just a big confusing stupid thing that happens we're still really down to earth in that area and we may suffer for it a lot of times because we don't get things done but Oh well. Save a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> it's just funner and simpler that way. Yeah, good. Yeah. Having a family, does, did that change your your uh, attitude towards music at all? Mm, not towards the music. But to, to the life combined with it? Mm, I seem that much more optimistic. I mean, I totally, uh, I like having a family, it's fun, it's great, but, um, you know, I'm so angry about a lot of other things, you know, in life, so it doesn't really, you know, stop, stop me from being angry in music, hmm. it doesn't, it doesn't change us very much. Do you sometimes, uh, do write together with your wife? What? Do you sometimes write together with your wife? Or create stuff? Sometimes we use it. I, I wouldn't say it's really writing, it's just jamming, mm. just playing together. I think Royal Penny and Tea. What? Royal Penny Tea. Was Penny Royal Tea. Penny Royal Tea, yeah. Yeah. Well, they're covering that song. It's mostly my song, you know. But so, um, kind of just jammed on it together and they want to record a version of it. Okay, I'm gonna finish. Thanks a lot. Yeah. How many more do you have to do today? I don't know. Metropole gilt derzeit als die Hauptstadt der Rocky.